And then if anything happens, why, we can provide a transcript or, well, that's good. or a tape. I hope something happens. All right. No, but I mean if anything should happen to your machines. That's, that's what these are on here for. We'll put these on the table. So you've had a quite a busy, busy day around here today. A little bit. <laughs> All right. Had a little surprise for us this morning. This morning with the... Oh. Uh, well, gee, I don't know why. That's just routine. Just routine. We, uh, <laughs> Tuesday morning. Uh, can we ask you, since we, our time is limited, if you would, can tell us anything about what's been going on in Geneva? Because that's what I think everyone is the most interested well, in. Well, let me, let me just say, there isn't too much I can tell you right at the moment, but I have just finished talking to uh, uh, George Schultz. The meetings are concluded, and in 45 minutes, by our time, George will be... Uh, addressing the press over there, making a statement to the press, and probably taking some of their questions. And then he will be uh, home. Uh, some of the others are going uh, to stop by other heads of state, like Bud McFarland's going to go to uh, Seamus Thatcher, and I think also in France and Italy, and brief others of our allies on uh, uh, what took place. And George will be here to brief me tomorrow afternoon. and. Then I'll know more when they start asking questions at the press conference tomorrow night. Are you night. pleased with what's happened? I mean, has it met what you expected? It sounds very good. I don't want to go to any further than uh, calling attention to what George is going to say, but uh, I, I think it's, uh, uh, we're going to see uh, meetings uh, that uh, will be arranged uh, shortly, uh, uh, meetings to negotiate. Uh, the nuclear weapons and uh, space and all. But this, this really meet what you had hoped. Have you got? Have we gotten from this what we had hoped to get? Yes. This is this is all this meeting was supposed to do is to establish procedures for negotiations. I'm afraid some of the people uh, overlooked that, and I I'd flinch a little when I would see references, and particularly in the air, that uh, as if this was supposed to be the arms negotiation. No, this was to set up the procedures. But there was always a question whether it would, in fact, set up the procedures. That's right, yes. From what you're saying, the announcement will tell us that it, in I, fact, has. I think that's what George will be telling people in uh, 45 minutes. Okay, let's, I guess, we'll switch to domestic issues. We, the Senate Republicans are planning to put out a budget several days before you put out your budget. And there have been information from White House officials in recent days that they don't think you'll be able to reach the targets that have been established about a month or so ago for deficit reduction. Do you think that this process is moving away from the White House? Do you think there's some danger you may be dealt out of this process? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, I'm uh, perfectly willing to have the Senate do that. I think that uh, in working together, they may have some ideas we didn't have. But no, what our goal is and what we uh, hope to present to the Congress in our budget proposal is one in which the overall spending will be no greater in 86 than it was in 85. Now, that means that because some things are inflexible, such as the interest on the debt, that there will be uh, some particular parts of government that will be getting less money. Uh, there may be uh, some that um, we think ought to be eliminated. And uh, so it won't be in a freeze in the sense of freezing every item of spending in the budget at its previous level. Some will be increased, some will be decreased, some will be eliminated. But the total uh, will, we're aiming at will be no increase in overall spending. But many people on the Hill and many Republicans as well as Democrats are saying this, are saying that because of your feeling that defense spending has to grow at the rate or close to the rate intended, and because of what you've said about Social Security and other things like that, that it's impossible to reach even that goal. No, let me take two items. Uh, defense, to begin with. For 1986, the Defense Department itself has come in with a bigger cut than had been asked in the original plan that came over from OMB. The difficulty there, however, is in the out years. And I think that defense has a legitimate uh, argument about not setting figures. Now, you know, we're required uh, anymore by Congress, and I have to tell you, having been eight years in the budgeting process in California, 
I do not look with great favor upon this idea that you're supposed to project for the next five years what your budgets are going to be. And with defense, their argument is that no one in, with regard to defense spending can tell you what the necessities are going to be uh, down the road or in years ahead. Uh, what if a potential adversary does something in the coming year that forces your hand to have to meet in some way with an additional defense capability or whatever. So defense has done it for this year and then has expressed the uh, inability. They have to project some figures, but those figures are meaningless um, for the out years, but they've done that. Now, as for Social Security, uh, here again, I'd like to point out with regard to Social Security that uh, while Social Security is included in the unified budget, and that again by an edict of Congress, Social Security is totally funded by a, a payroll tax, and that payroll tax cannot be used uh, for any other part of government. In other words, if, uh, uh, if, if you somehow reduced Social Security, actually Social Security is running a surplus over and above its its present uh, income, but that surplus goes into their trust fund. It cannot be used to fund uh, some other department of government. So there's been some indications of some, an administration official who met with a group of reporters yesterday indicated that you might be willing to accept some kind of freeze on cost of living adjustments for Social Security recipients if Congress gets together on the idea. No, I think what uh, whoever that individual was, was referring to was uh, someplace here in our own meetings, and there have been hours of them on the budget thing. Uh, uh, my own remark uh, on one occasion that obviously if Congress was, because there were, there were stories that Congress was uh, targeting and said something should be done about that, that if Congress uh, in mass came down on the side of, uh, say, reducing or holding off on the COLA, the cost of living increase. Uh, you know, what would I be able to do about that? Now, a veto is only possible if, uh, if there's a, uh, a chance that your veto be upheld. And I never remark about possible vetoes until whatever legislation we're talking about comes down to my desk and I see it. But uh, that was the only remark. But again, as I say, uh, you can't blame uh, any of the deficit on Social Security. Are you saying that they would have to be able to pass it over your veto in order for that to happen? Or that? Well, I'm saying I'm waiting to see what is Congress's attitude about that. But you might be willing to change your previous position on that if it looked like an overwhelming number of congressmen really felt this was necessary. No, I. I I feel committed to what I said about Social Security uh, before, that this uh, attempt during the campaign, as they did in 1982, to uh, charge that I had secret plans for reducing Social Security. I had no such plans, I have no such plans, and uh, I see no reason uh, to target Social Security when it has no, plays no part in the deficit. So that, in fact, that you're basically not encouraging this idea very no, much? No, um, Some of the conservatives in town um, are, have been watching what's been going on with your administration, especially since the election, and they see Bill Clark is going to go back to California, and they see that Ed Meese is going to go to the Justice Department, and from their initial comments, they're not going to be any much more happy with Don Regan than they are with Jim Baker, and they're afraid that the they're not going to be any true believers in this White House in the second term. Should they be concerned? No, I don't think so, because the true believer in the White House is sitting here in the Oval Office. And no one has been whittling at me or trying to change my philosophy uh, since I've been here. But now, the case, for example, of Amis going over to justice. Well, he's been a counselor to me, and we've been together for a great many years, as you well know. Well. Being my attorney general does not remove him from my being able to seek his counsel whenever I uh, feel like doing so. 
Uh, as for Don Regan coming over here, uh, I don't know how anyone can complain uh, about him ideologically or philosophically. He has been as loyal to everything that I've wanted to do uh, as anyone that I could name. So you think that's, this is not something they should worry so much about? No, and uh, uh, sometimes I wonder if some of those very vocal conservatives are really conservatives in conservatives' eyes. They're not in mine. But if they, one of the people they would like to see you find a place for is Mrs. Kirkpatrick. I want to find a place for Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Have you found one yet? We'll be talking again after, uh, uh, after the inaugural. Uh, I could quite understand. She's been longer in her post at the UN than anyone who ever held that job. And uh, it is a job in which you can find yourself saying enough already. And, uh, but uh, I, would, I am hoping that uh, I can find that I can keep her in the administration. With all these changes, how, how do you think this, how do you feel about this? You're going to enter your second term with a rather changed cast of characters around here. And a lot of people you've dealt with for a long time, really, like yeah. Ed and, and Mike are not going to be here. Well, uh, Ed's going to be here, as I say. He's, uh, he's within reach. He'll still be a member of the cabinet. He'll just be sitting in a different chair. And uh, uh, Mike, I can understand his, uh, his wanting to leave now and for the private sector. But um, this isn't as many changes as some administrations have had. It's been remarkably stable up till now. Yes, and, uh, and I have been gratified by that because everyone that I asked to serve, I told them as I told the public that I recognized that they, many of them, most of them would be coming at a great personal sacrifice. <laughs> and I could not expect them uh, to contract in for the run of the show. And uh, so they've all known that when the time came that they felt they had to return to their own lives, uh, uh, I would understand and I'd try to replace them with someone equally qualified. And uh, I'm just gratified that we have so many still here and some of the moves are just, as I say, changing uh, slots but still here in government. Let me ask you about this new latest change. Is this correct that you didn't know what was going on until they came to you <laughs> yesterday? They weren't ready to come to me until yesterday. All I know is that it was originally it was, John, it was Don Regan's idea and um, he'd talked to Jim. Jim has, has always uh, and has let me know he has always wanted if something opened up to a cabinet post and um, He's been a, a long stretch, four full years here in that job. He, he encouraged the uh, secretary with this idea. No, as a matter of fact, it was Don's idea. And Don himself felt that uh, he'd had enough of what he was doing, that he wanted a change. Uh, so uh, I was. Were you easily convinced? What? Were you easily convinced? Well, I. Don came and we had a, a talk about it, and then I had to talk with Jim. I wanted to make sure that this was uh, something that both of them were very happy about and wanted to do, and frankly, uh, I thought it was a great idea. It sure beat having them decide to go back to private life. Um, now that you have Mr. We're going to have Don Regan over here, you're going to have his tax plan over here, too? You're going <laughs> to. <laughs> no, that'll be uh, Jim's to sell up on the hill, but uh, I'm quite sure that. Uh, Don will be most helpful in that because... Are you going to uh, endorse it basically in your, in your State of the Union speech? Uh, I'm going to speak of the need for simplifying taxes. I'm not going to get into de de great details as I uh, will in the subsequent State of the Union address. But uh, the tax program, and incidentally, some of your colleagues in the press and particularly columnists have been uh, sniping that I'm dangling in the wind here and uh, all the momentum has stopped uh, because we haven't been doing anything with that. That's not true. We ha realized, all of us agreed, that the first priority had to be the budget. And we've been spending hours and hours. We've had no time to go on something else. When that's done, then we go at the tax program. And that's one that, just like the budget, we're going to have to look at everything that has been recommended, 
treat some of them, I'm sure, as options, and then decide what form we want to take it. I think it's been one of the best tax studies that's ever been made. But you're not ready to endorse a lot of the specifics in it yet. Uh, well, we haven't had time to do as we've done with the budget, to sit down with it and say, all right, point by point, let's go through it. I haven't even done that. Uh, I have a copy of the plan on my desk. And uh, while I've read a summary, I haven't been able to do that because my mind is too filled with the budget. Do you, do you, could you tell us the level of your confidence that, that you can enact a plan along the lines you described and meet the deficit reduction targets that you set? Yes, I think we can. Yeah. And the, the goal is one thing that I will be saying uh, publicly is that uh, there's never been any thought on the part of any of us that after 50 years of built-in structural deficit spending, with only a few exceptional years when it didn't take place, that there's no way that you can gear segments of the society to government uh, doing many of these things and then just pull the rug out from them all at once and say we're gonna balance the budget in one year. It just couldn't be done. It's only fair to do as we will with some programs and say to the people, look, this program is going to either disappear down here or be reduced down sizably before in the, in the years ahead to give people a chance to adjust to this. So, uh, yes, we, we have hit upon a plan of putting us on a declining path as far as the deficits are concerned to the point that we will be able to project a date certain at which the budget will be balanced. And uh, then, I would hope, and before then, I would hope that we would make it constitutionally impossible for the government to run another deficit. Mr. President, Bro, the last question. Bro had a, you had a question you wanted to I was going to ask, uh, given the fairly widespread view, perception, that, that uh, you don't think too highly of the media, however one defines it. I wonder if, if you would tell us what you do think of, not the media, but uh, newspapers and television specifically, and, and what the faults are and what the... Well, I've never had any complaints about the paper you represent. Uh, <laughs> well, that's right. No, I think that inside the Beltline here in Washington is a kind of a company town. And uh, the great search for leaks and the premature uh, billing of something as, an, uh, as a fact uh, when many times it isn't a fact, uh, this, this can become a problem. It can become a problem, for example, in, on the international scene to uh, take uh, a, a leak, some information from someone who won't let their name be used and to take this as as valid enough to print on the front page of a paper and then leave us with having to mend fences with uh, some friendly government that is offended by uh, this misinformation. And there have been cases of that kind. Uh, I guess all that, all that I would like to say is that I wish that the, the media that does so much of that that portion of the media. I wish that they would have an ethic in which they would check that out with us to see whether it in some way might be harmful to our national security. And, uh, and take our word for it if we said that it would be. and We'd be willing to explain why it would be. Uh, then we might uh, we might not have so many incidents that do cause us problems and set back sometimes uh, uh, programs that have been going forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, is it true that, I've, as I've heard, that you have some interest in astrology? Someone told me that recently. <laughs> no, no. I'll tell you, we had a, uh, we knew personally, uh, Nancy and I, the uh, uh, gentleman out in California. Uh, that did this for the uh, Los Angeles Times. 
And so knowing him and all, it used to be fun in the morning, I'd morning him with the paper to, and it was easy for me because I always read the comics and uh, they put it on the same page as the comics that I would uh, take delight in uh, telling Nancy what her day was going to be and, and, and what mine was supposed to be and so forth. But, you know what the signs are for your inauguration? Uh, no. Uh, nope, I haven't, no, I, did, I haven't done things like that. I looked that. it up, it looked pretty good. It did? For, you're an Aquarian. I'm yeah. an Aquarian, yes. And of course, uh, I do believe that part of astrology since I found out that there are more Aquarians in the, uh, uh, recorded up there in New York someplace in the uh, well-known citizens uh, <laughs> list of, uh, uh, so of I said, well, that must, yes, the Hall yeah. of Fame. So I said, well, that must be, must be true then. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Right. Right. We appreciate the time. Uh, Thank you very much. You bet. So put yeah. this up, I'm not being hung here.